Hello, and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week, we welcome Dr. Jonathan Lenin, Chair of the Astronomy Department at Cornell University, to the show, telling us all about the volcanoes of Venus. But first, we're going to journey out to the L9859 planetary system exploring a trio of intriguing exoplanets. Next, we're going to take a trip out to the Trojan asteroids of Jupiter, along with the Lucy spacecraft as it readies for launch. Finally, we're ready for the Perseid meteor shower due to rain down to Earth on the nights of the 12th and 13th of August. New examination of the L9859 planetary system reveals hidden details of three exoplanets in that solar system. One of these is found to have a mass just half that of Venus, while another appears to be a water world. This new study by researchers at the European Southern Observatory also shows evidence for a fourth and possibly even a fifth world in that stellar system, a mere 35 light years from Earth. The Lucy spacecraft arrived at Kennedy Space Center on the 30th of July, readying for its unprecedented journey to explore the Trojan asteroids of Jupiter. Once this robotic explorer reaches the orbit of Jupiter, Lucy will start to explore the asteroids which travel along with Jupiter in its journey around the Sun. Now, these asteroids are composed of some of the oldest material in the solar system, and this mission hopes to reveal some of the secrets concerning the formation of our whole family of planets, including the Earth. Join us here on 14th of September when we're going to talk with Dr. Kathy Olkin, Deputy Principal Investigator on the Lucy Mission. Sky gazers around the Northern Hemisphere will be treated to a display of shooting stars this week as the Perseid meteor shower peaks on the nights of the 12th and 13th of August. Now, this is one of the largest annual displays of meteors, often delivering 60 to 100 shooting stars per hour. The Perseids are also known for producing fireballs, the brightest and most dramatic of these displays. No special equipment is needed to view the Perseid meteor display, and viewers should head outside to a dark area Thursday night around 10 p.m. or later uh, local time and look towards the northeast. The best show will come just before dawn on Friday. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth. And we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Next up, we talk with Dr. Jonathan Lemin about fascinating new discoveries concerning the atmosphere as well as the volcanoes of Venus. This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we're happy to be joined by Dr. Jonathan Lunin. He is chair of the astronomy department at Cornell, 
and he's found recently found some unique findings about our neighboring planet Venus. Welcome to the show, Jonathan. Very glad to be here. Thank you so much. Can you tell us a little bit about what it is that you found and what makes it so intriguing? Sure. So um, this is work that was done um, with my graduate student, Yak Trung, who is the first author on a paper in Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. And uh, what we found was that um, the phosphine, PH3, that was reported uh, to have been detected in the atmosphere of Venus. This was a detection reported last fall um, that we uh, are able to explain that phosphine with volcanism and that the, um, the presence of phosphine is, we argue, a signpost of very active volcanism, indeed explosive volcanism on Venus. Now, the initial explanation for the presence of that pH 3 by the um, original authors of the discovery, Greaves et al., was that it was a signpost of biology. And uh, there are a few reasons why uh, we think that's unlikely. And we looked for um, other explanations, and uh, we find that uh, volcanism works, that it's a, a large amount of volcanism, but reasonable amount for a planet the size and composition of Venus, which of course is very, very close in uh, both, uh, both aspects to that of the Earth in terms of size and, and density. Huh. And so we also find phosphine here on Earth in our atmosphere. You know, oh, yeah. how, is that, how is that different from the phosphine we're seeing on Venus? Well, we find a little bit in, in our own atmosphere, not very much. Um, and, you know, one of the debates is the extent to which life plays a role in, in, um, uh, in producing phosphine. Phosphine's very, uh, it's a very reducing version of phosphorus. That means there's a lot of hydrogen in it, pH3, obviously. Um, energetically, it's not something that life... Uh, likes to produce because it's energetically not very favorable. Um, in that form, it's not very much utilizable by life. Of course, phosphorus itself as an element is extremely important for life, right? I mean, it is the centerpiece of the energy currency in our cells, the uh, adenosine diphosphate to triphosphate reaction. And it's the centerpiece of the bonds in DNA and RNA that um, uh, are the information carrying molecules of, of life. So, so phosphorus is very important, but, but not particularly in that form. Now, life can produce pH 3, but in the case of Venus, I think most of your listeners know that the surface of Venus has a temperature above the melting point of lead. Uh, organic molecules would completely fall apart there. But for many decades, beginning um, with really Carl Sagan in the 1960s, there have been speculations that maybe life might be present in the clouds of Venus. Uh, those clouds are sulfuric acid clouds, but they have a little bit of water in them. And um, a number of workers, in particular uh, a group at MIT uh, led by Sarah Seeger and others, have has speculated on the possibility of um, cycling bacteria uh, into those clouds and, and perhaps cycling nutrients into them. So um, I, I'm not arguing against that idea. It's an interesting idea, but again, uh, as always with the question of whether one has found life somewhere else, it's very important to look first for uh, a non-biological explanation because as Carl Sagan himself pointed out, extraordinary claims and life on another planet is an extraordinary claim, requires extraordinary evidence. In this paper, we are arguing that a volcanic source is a plausible source and one should consider that first. And there are ways to test this idea. Hmm. And absolutely. And so what do we know about the volcanoes of Venus and how they might be going up going about producing this pH 3? 
Right. So we know volcanoes exist on Venus. Um, they were revealed by, um, by radar imaging, uh, first by the Soviets and then by the NASA Magellan spacecraft in the early 1990s, uh, which mapped almost the entire surface of Venus. Uh, we know that Venus um, is uh, covered, mostly covered, not 100 percent, with um, what are thought to be basaltic flows generated by relatively recent volcanism. That would be uh, in the last um, anywhere from perhaps half billion years of Venus's history to, to more recent times. Uh, we don't see very many impact craters. That tells us these flows are young. And uh, some of the images show the presence of volcanoes. Many of these look like shield volcanoes, the sort of uh, volcanoes that produce uh, thicker lava. They're not so explosive or rich in, in, in uh, gases, but, but there are some that could in fact uh, be explosive. So that's what the images tell us. Now, there's circumstantial evidence from other data that there's active volcanism. Uh, there have been variations in the abundance of sulfur dioxide that have been seen from observations. That could be an indication of um, volcanic gases reaching the stratosphere. And I should add that it's difficult to see the surface because of this global cloud cover. That's why radar has to be used and why we can't observe these volcanoes directly. And then there's some evidence from uh, some near-infrared observations made by Venus Express of um, extra, uh, extra energy, extra radiance in the near infrared that could perhaps be a signpost of volcanism. So where we pick up the story is um, on the Earth, at least in the Earth's mantle, uh, phosphorus is present in the form of phosphides. A phosphide is a phosphorus bound to a metal, uh, like iron, for example. Uh, those uh, are um, extruded uh, from the Earth's mantle to the surface uh, in volcanoes. And so in our mechanism, uh, if Venus has a similar mantle where there is phosphorus, that makes sense, then um, explosive volcanism could inject volcanic dust that contains those phosphides into the stratosphere. Uh, what we found was a laboratory work that showed that uh, a mixture of sulfuric acid and water very efficiently will break down those phosphides and convert them to phosphine, PH3, uh, rapidly enough that uh, the destruction of phosphine, which is also rapid in the atmosphere, doesn't quite destroy all of it. And so there is there's some that remains on the order of a few parts per billion. Uh, which is what was measured by um, uh, by the radio observers in their original report last fall. So we get the phosphorus from the mantle. It's ejected by explosive volcanism into the stratosphere. The sulfuric acid cloud droplets with water convert that to phosphine, and that's what's observed. And, and the implication then is that there's an active, uh, we're, we're in an active epoch of volcanism on Venus, with volcanoes somewhat like Krakatoa and possibly levels of volcanism similar to what produced um, the Deccan traps on the Earth some time ago. Uh, and, and that's the picture that we're painting. It is a speculative picture um, because we don't have direct evidence of active volcanism and we need a lot of it, but we don't need an unphysically large amount. We just need Venus to be rather volcanically active at this time. And I, I love that, you know, you talked about Carl Sagan, because he was my childhood idol. And, uh, you know, he famously, you know, talked about, you know, looking at Venus saying, oh, we can't see anything on the surface because of this cloud layer. Therefore, there must be, must be swamps. Therefore, there must be dinosaurs. Right. You know, and talk about, you know, this faulty chain of not quite logic that can that could, you know, lead to, uh, you know, uh, ideas of the sur about the surface that aren't there. So how do we study the surface of Venus when it Great. is hidden so, so much by a perpetual cloud layer? Great question. And I want to give Carl credit for something else. Not only did he say that, but he did in the 1960s 
produced one of the early uh, reports. It was actually a, a NASA report, a JPL report that he wrote um, on uh, the idea that Venus had a very um, large greenhouse effect, that the surface temperature was very much elevated uh, above what we see on the Earth and that therefore it was likely to have a very different environment, a, a surface environment that would not be habitable. And uh, it was his, uh, his student, James Pollock, then at NASA Ames, who led the team that did the first quantitative study of the, the super greenhouse effect on Venus, a study that helped to validate the idea of the greenhouse effect in general, and therefore uh, very much connected to our understanding of climate change on the Earth today. So how do we study Venus through this global layer of sulfuric acid clouds? Well, one way is with radar. And so the Soviet Union pioneered that, NASA um, followed on with a better radar system in the 90s. Uh, Veritas, which is a mission that has just been selected under the NASA Discovery Program, will go back to Venus at the end of this decade and use uh, even more powerful radar systems and also infrared sensors to probe the nature of the surface and uh, not only its physical appearance, but even its composition. Uh, so those are primary ways to do it. Another is to send probes down through the clouds. Um, uh, again, the Russians, uh, the Soviet Union led the way on that with their series of Venera landers, but uh, the Pioneer Venus mission in the late 1970s sent uh, several probes uh, to the surface, I guess it was two probes, one of which a large probe had a mass spectrometer device for measuring directly the composition of the atmosphere. And, and in fact, when this phosphine discovery was announced, uh, which was done by radio telescopes on the Earth, uh, a group went back and looked at the Pioneer Venus data from 1978, reanalyzed those data in the year 2020, so, you know, 42 years later, um, and they do see some evidence for those compounds. But we want to go back with a better system of in situ uh, instruments to go through the atmosphere and sample that, and the Da Vinci uh, discovery mission, which was also selected by NASA this year, will do exactly that. So probing at wavelengths where we can get through the clouds and sending physical probes that can make direct measurements of the atmosphere, those are the best way to get below those pesky global layers of cloud. And finally, what is it that you hope to find with the Varietas and Da Vinci missions? Um, I'm very interested in Venus because I think it will tell us uh, in a very profound sense what the boundaries are for the Earth remaining habitable for billions of years. Mars is important, but Mars is a small planet and its smallness had an effect on its habitability. Venus is the size of the Earth and the question of when it lost its ocean, and we know from measurements of deuterium in the atmosphere that it did once have an ocean. When it lost that ocean and how it lost those ocean, that ocean will tell us um, at what point in the life cycle of the sun, as the sun gets brighter and brighter, uh, the Earth itself will lose its ocean and therefore lose its habitability. So Venus is crucially important in that regard, and those two uh, missions will set the stage for um, more ambitious missions ultimately to go to the surface to look for evidence of rocks, not with these missions, but with the follow-ons, to look for evidence of rocks that had liquid water in them, uh, hydrated basalts or andesites or even granites, that ultimately will tell us how far did Venus proceed in its geologic evolution before it lost that ocean? How long in the history of the solar system did it hold on to that ocean? Uh, the two missions, Veritas and Da Vinci, will start that process by giving us a detailed map of the surface, um, the global composition uh, by remote sensing, and make measurements of atmospheric composition to really give us the details about whether there is phosphine and other indications of active geology. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Jonathan. It was great talking with you. It was a great pleasure. I, I had a great time. Thank you. Thank you. And that was Dr. Jonathan Lunin, Chair of the Astronomy Department at Cornell University.
Next week, on the 17th of August, we're going to welcome Dr. Richard T. from the Center for Astrophysics to the show. And we're going to be discussing his work discovering the first moon ever found in another star system. Visit with us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring the cosmos down to Earth and scientists directly into your homes with fun, informative interviews. Subscribe to our VIP newsletter to see every episode of the show one day early. Uh, We depend on support from viewers just like you. For ways to help support this program, including VIP subscriptions, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, Please download and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, or your favorite podcast provider. Remember, you can watch every episode of this show at thecosmiccompanion.tv. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net.